One of the hardest things to get rid of when you're trying to lose weight is belly fat. People struggle with this every year when they're trying to get ready for vacation season or a big event that they have coming up or any kind of get together where you don't want to look like you just swallowed a small child. And it's almost impossible to get rid of, right? Or is it? This group of doctors says it's not as hard as you think and they're going to show you how to do it right after this. <music> So belly fat's almost impossible to lose. That's what we've been told forever and ever and ever. That last little bit just won't come off. Now, before we start, I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving medical advice, but these guys are. So pay attention to what they have to say. It's really going to help you. It's helped me a lot, and it's going to help you as well. Well, Dr. Eyes, which some of you may have heard of, is going to shatter the myth that we've been told forever and ever that belly fat is the hardest to lose. He's gonna tell you why it's not right now. All right, so with Science Bob's help, we're gonna help everyone understand today that belly fat may not be the hardest fat to lose. The question one thing, we've created two kinds of fat for you. That's what Science Bob has done. There's the belly fat, which I want you to put in your hands if you don't mind, just show it to everybody. And then there's the other kind of fat in your body. Okay, now, now keep holding that for a second. And look at this fat that I've got, okay? Now this is the fat that's in your thighs, behind your arms, under your chin. This is the other fat, that's the belly fat. There's a okay. subtle difference between them. And it turns out the fat in your belly is very unique. So imagine that these crystals here represent eating right and exercising, all that good stuff. Go ahead and sprinkle that over the fat. Okay, so we both, we, we both are gonna exercise and eat right and all those things. Right. We're both gonna sprinkle on our fat, okay? Good, sprinkle it on, there you go, there you go. Excellent. Now go ahead and mix it up, you know, get a little exercise there yourself. So then you mix that up. Dr. Oz does the same thing. You might notice something happening to that. Ooh. What is happening to it? It's becoming liquid. It's becoming liquid. Yeah. So it's actually liquefying. We can actually demonstrate this. Uh, you know, I've got a bucket here. Yeah. But let me show you. It's actually your most liquid asset, that stomach fat. It's supposed to be able to. That's it up. Science mouth. Hold me. There we go. Belly fat. Watch what happens. It gently. Ooh. All those blobs come pouring out. Now let me show you what happens with my fat. I did the same thing. Okay. Nada. Ooh. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> well, <laughs> pretend that didn't happen. Pretend that didn't happen. But in general, we actually always thought that fat was sort of equally stubborn. Right. The belly fat is particularly able to be a liquid asset, to sort of pour out of your body. And that's why it's so important to understand that even five or 10 pounds, a little bit of weight loss, immediately begins to affect this, which has a huge benefit, because that's the fat that causes all the problems with blood pressure and cholesterol and diabetes, all that bad stuff. Okay. So the second you begin losing weight, the second you start benefiting in a very big way for your health. Now, to teach us a bit more about this, because this myth is busted, my friends, I want you to understand a little bit more about... Now, I probably lost some people already just bringing Dr. Oz into the conversation because a lot of people don't believe a lot of the things that he says, and a lot of times, you have a valid point. That was a great point. For those of you that are still watching after Dr. Oz, the problem that I really have with Dr. Oz is that if you watch him long enough, you're going to have cabinets, closets, drawers, storage lockers, maybe a shed in the backyard full of supplements. Because every show he talks about a different supplement and what you gotta do and what you gotta take. Well, this next group of doctors doesn't believe that you need any of that stuff. They're gonna show you how to lose it without it, but stick around till the end because there is one important supplement you can take for pennies that will definitely help reduce that belly fat. So you want six pack abs? The truth is they're there. They just may be covered up with a layer of belly fat. One of my favorite doctors, the one that I believe has made the biggest difference, at least in my life and probably a lot of others, Dr. Ken Berry is going to tell you how to uncover those six-pack abs as fast as possible. Check this out. So you want some six-pack abs, I see. That's good. I'm going to tell you in this video things that are a waste of time and money to do to get there, and then some other things you can do that will give you the biggest bang for your buck and the most results for your effort. Now, let's talk about, first of all, the things that you should not do, the things you shouldn't waste your time and money on because they've been proven time and time again to not work. Uh, the first and foremost is the biggest myth, and that is calories in, calories out model. If you just burn more calories than you ingest, then somehow you'll magically lose the weight, and then you'll be able to see your six-pack. Because here's, here's the secret. 
You already have a six pack right now sitting there. You have a six pack. The fact that you can raise up out of bed in the morning, the fact that you can walk upright without falling forwards or backwards, the fact that you can sit upright in a chair means that you already have very active and strong rectus abdominis muscles. And those are the muscles that we classically call the six pack. It's really an eight pack or a 10 pack, but only in the skin skinniest, lowest body fat percentage of people can you see all 10. And so calories in, calories in does not work. There are very large medical studies. Uh, the, the one that comes to mind is the Women's Health Initiative, where they calorie restricted groups of women for years and years and years, a very large group of women. And they lost about half a kilogram, which is about a pound in seven years. So stop worrying about counting calories. Stop worrying about cutting back on calories, cutting back on portion size. All of those things are just different ways of saying that if you'll just eat fewer calories than you burn, you'll lose fat. And it's just not true. It doesn't work that way. Weight loss and fat loss is a hormonal issue. It's not a calorie issue. Your body doesn't know what calories are and your body definitely doesn't count calories. Therefore, you shouldn't either. Okay. The second thing is any kind of spot reduction. So whether it's a ab sizer or the ab roller or the ab lounge, none of this stuff works. So this is all a uniform Formerly, a uh, terrible waste of money. You can do a thousand sit-ups a day, and if your body fat percentage is too high, you will never ever see your six-pack in the mirror, nor will people see your six-pack as you walk down the street with your abdomen revealed. So stop buying products that that promise to reveal your six-pack or to spot reduce weight that never ever works it never ever works okay the third thing is that if you'll work out if you'll if you'll do lots of crunches lots of sit-ups lots of leg raises that that will somehow make your abdominal muscles your rectus abdominis muscles so prominent that it will shine through through the large thick layer of fat that you may currently have on your belly that never works. That's not going to work. That doesn't happen that way. If you if you worked out hard enough to make your rectus abdominis muscles, the, the striations in them show through your, your thick layer of belly fat, then you would actually be fatter. You would increase your, your waist and your hip circumference just because of building up all that extra muscle, but you would not get rid of the fat, and therefore you still wouldn't be getting the goal, which is a flat tummy where you can see your six pack. So any of these things, it, it, it kind of all plays back into the Western model of problem solving. If you want to solve a problem, then you should buy a product, you should buy a supplement, or you should work harder because you have to earn it. None of that stuff is actually the case. So let's talk about the three things that actually will reveal your six pack that you already have. It's already in there. You just want to be able to see it and you want others to be able to enjoy it. Here's how you do it. First of all, you have to eat a diet that helps to keep your insulin level very, very low normal. If you're eating multiple times a day, like uh, the classic example is, oh, here's a hundred calorie snack well or some kind of little snack bar, or you, you, you drink calorie reduction shakes and they're supposed to somehow help you lose weight. None of that stuff works. That's all a waste of money. You've got to eat a diet that keeps your insulin level low normal. If you do that, then your body naturally starts to burn the fat on your belly, inside your belly, on your booty and other places. Your body never spot reduces. It always takes off the fat in a very predictable way, depending on your one of two body types, whether you're an apple or a pear, that's kind of the, really the only two body types that actually matter. All the other body type hype that you may have heard of is just another way to sell products, supplements, books, and that sort of thing. So as you eat uh, either a low-carb, high-fat, an ancestral, a, a low-fat paleo, or a ketogenic diet, all of those diets will work to at least a certain degree. It looks like from just my personal experience at the Berry Clinic and from many, many hundreds of other people who have reached out to me on social media that the ketogenic diet, very, very low-carb, very high-healthy-fat diet, seems to work best for most people for losing body fat. And remember, body fat's what's hiding your six-pack, right? And so a ketogenic diet or one of the very high-fat, 
high healthy fat, low, low carb diets is going to keep your insulin level low normal. Insulin hormone is a hormone of building and of gaining weight. That's what it does. Okay. And so if your insulin level is high from that hundred calorie snack cake you just ate, you're not going to lose any fat because you're not going to burn any fat. Your body only burns fat when your insulin level is low. So the first thing you got to do is adopt a way of eating, not just a temporary diet, but a way of eating that's going to keep your insulin level low normal for months and months and months and months because it's going to take that long to get the fat off that it took you years to put on, right? That's number one, eat the right diet. And it's a diet that becomes a way of eating that keeps your insulin level low, normal, almost all every hour of every day. That's how you do that. Number two is when should you eat? And this brings up the second point is that when you don't eat, your insulin level stays, in fact, very, very low normal. And that's a very good thing for fat loss, like we've already talked about. You're not so much interested in weight loss because that can mean you're losing muscle, you're losing bone, you're losing liver organs. We're talking about fat reduction. We want to reduce your body fat percentage. That's how you will see those mythical six-pack abs, okay? So I recommend highly that you implement at least some variation of intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. What I personally do is I have a 20-hour a window where I don't eat almost every single day, and then a four-hour window where I do eat. And when I do eat, it is a very high healthy fat diet, very super, super low carb diet. That's how I'm rediscovering my six pack abs. I used to be very slender and very athletic in my teens and twenties and for the first couple of years in my thirties, but then that quickly changed. But now I'm rediscovering my six pack abs by implementing both a ketogenic diet and intermittent or time-restricted eating fasting. And so you don't have to do 20-hour fast every day. You can start out with a 14-hour fast every day. And then for the remaining 10 hours, you can eat a keto diet, okay? And after a week or two or three of that, you can increase your fasting period from 14 hours to 16 hours. And just keep going until you've got to 18 hours, 20 hours. Some people even do a 22-hour every day uh, time-restricted feeding window. And so they're only eating for two or three or four hours every day. Now you think, well, gosh, that's that must be miserable. They must be miserable. But no, they're not. Because when you eat a very high healthy fat ketogenic diet, you're full. You're not suffering. You're not hungry. You're not starving yourself. And that makes this diet very sustainable. You can do it for months and months and months. Or even there are many people who have been doing it for over a decade. OK, so then the third thing that you have to have, because you can tell from number one and number two, that this is not a quick fix. This is not an overnight fix. If you have belly fat to lose, it took you years to probably accumulate that belly fat. Now, what, the fat, what is that? It's stored energy. Right. And so when you keep your insulin level very low, normal, your body can then burn that energy that you've accumulated on your belly, inside your belly, on your booty, on your thighs, wherever it is. I'm not judging. I'm just saying if you want to burn that fat, you have to keep your insulin level very low normal. And the two most powerful tools for doing that are the ketogenic way of eating and a time restricted eating window. So the third thing that you're going to have to have, my friend, is patience. OK, this is not going to happen in days or weeks. This is going to happen over months and months and months, depending on how much body fat you have to lose and how much belly fat you have to lose. So there, the, that's it. That is the answer. That is the solution. That is the secret is that there's no spot reduction. Calorie restriction does not work. There is no quick fix. If you see anything advertised on the internet, on social media, on late night TV, it's all crap. None of that works. Okay. So save your money and invest it in really good quality food and then learn all the ins and outs of intermittent fasting. So are you excited to get that six pack revealed? Well, check out Dr. Eric Westman and he's going to tell you one of the secrets to burning belly fat really fast. What I do is very similar to what the Atkins diet is. And well, so I guess the first thing I, I do is listen and then give hope because I've had people come to me who they've had diabetes for 20 years on insulin and just a simple thing like changing the food. And you do have to be very strict about it if you're going to try to fix diabetes. Uh, it can be very powerful. 
So I, I say, uh, well, you know, maybe you haven't tried this. And well, I, if it's the first visit to me, I'll even say, well, you haven't tried it with me. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it seems like everyone is is searching and trying to find the 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 one simple answer. And um, that answer actually has been around 150 years, and that's to cut the carbs out. It's, it's focusing on sugar as the culprit, not fat or calories. That gets too confusing, but there's a lot of ways to, to be healthy. And, and um, if someone's ending up in the Duke Keto Medicine Clinic, which I call it now, uh, they've usually tried just about everything or they, they feel like they have. Um, and I like to start with lifestyle because it's very potent. And most people uh, can wrap their head around it and do it if they know the detail, you know, to be strict about it. Um, your body starts burning its own fat. And that's a wonderful thing. Feels great. Well, that sounds like a great thing, especially for somebody who has lost a lot of that hope and they've been carrying extra weight for a lot of years. We know carbs is a big piece of this, but let's start with somebody coming to your office. You gave that example, diabetes 20 years. What is the first step? As of the last two years, I, I, I'm now treating and, and helping teaching, basically teaching people over the internet more than I am in my office. And this is fascinating because um, it is so robust. It works so well if you teach it in a certain way. People don't even have to come see me or, or see a physician unless you're on medicine. So, so I've kind of learned the, the safe use, the guardrails, if you will, of how to use a very potent lifestyle method. And the first thing to do uh, is develop rapport. If, so if someone comes to me, they're on 10 different medicines, usually from three different doctors. And, and I'm going to be the one to come in and say, oh, you can stop all the... No, I, it, it's, a, it's a process. I need to first <laughs> develop rapport. Now, you know, it's fascinating. Some people come to me, they've already watched every YouTube video I ever did and they they you know some of them know the name of my firstborn child and and uh, others have no idea and the others are referred by the orthopedic surgeon because they need to have a knee replacement or a hip replacement and they're too heavy or or the heart surgeons actually send me people who are too heavy for a heart transplant so, you know, but even then they might not be motivated enough to wrap their head around stopping, you know, sweet tea. That's a, a, a delicacy. No, it's a staple in the South. In Southern United States, if you ask for tea, you get sugar tea, you get sweet tea. So you have to ask for unsweet tea in the Southern United States. But so developing rapport, getting an idea of the medical issues going on, if you're on medication and have medical issues. It, it, it really it requires the knowledge of someone trained in this because I can take people off medicines very quickly and you have to be careful. Now, let's say if you're not clinically ill, you're not on medicines on this, gosh, it really is just as simple as cutting down the carbs. And the degree to which you need to cut them down depends on your metabolism, depends on your age, depends on your your um, activity level. And it kind of, uh, the low carb world kind of selects out three different categories. So if you're young, healthy, active, you're a biker and you're, you know, running, uh, running marathons, you can have more carbs than if you're, you know, you've hurt your knee and you can't exercise at all and uh, or somewhere in between there. Um, so there are different carb levels, I think. Um, and uh, but as a place to start, if someone ends up in an office or, or wanting to take one of our courses to learn how to do it, my philosophy is to get it to work the first time every time. And so I teach people the strictest version of it so that I know that their body will become a fat burning body and they'll start changing the metabolism in a very, um, very safe and, and quick way. So uh, I, that's why I use a very strict version of a low carb keto diet. When you know, often people have selected themselves out, they know what they're getting into. But other, other times people have no idea. And I just kind of explain how our bodies work. I, a doctor means teacher. So really, all I'm doing is teaching as a doctor how our body works. I, I can accomplish so much by just changing the food. I don't use these medicines 
that are now being used to lower blood sugar and have you lose weight. Um, I suppose I could if asked, I, I, I might, but the diet itself is so powerful. Um, but insulin, it, it, to inject insulin, if you're type 1, you need it. it saves lives. Um, but the type 2s on insulin will, will really never get better. And you, know, you hear that language will manage your diabetes, right, on these ads on TV. Manage your diet. No, we want to reverse it. We want to. We want to fix it, and it is reversible, fixable in, in just about every case. Now there are some roadblocks to losing belly fat. The doctor of chiropractic, Eric Berg, is going to tell you what exactly stops you from burning belly fat. Let's talk about the top thing that can stop your ability to lose your midsection, your belly fat. And you're probably thinking it's sugar, right? Or carbs. But there's something else that's uh, of equal magnitude in preventing you from losing your belly fat. So let's say, for example, you're at the gym, you're doing exercise, you're doing sit-ups, and th this midsection just does not come off no matter what. And when I go to the gym, I do see a lot of people exercising for months without much loss. And there's also people on keto and people doing intermittent fasting that still just cannot lose that belly. So today we're going to talk about this really important barrier in getting your stomach flat. But warning, you may actually not like what I'm about to tell you. In fact, you may click off after hearing this, but realize I'm going to give you some good news. I'm going to give you a solution to this. I hate when someone gives you a video of bad news, bad things happening in the world, but they then don't give you a solution. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about alcohol, specifically wine. A lot of people are drinking wine, yet they're eating healthy and they're doing keto and they're doing fasting, but they still just cannot lose their midsection. And a lot of times they'll hear the concept that, you know, pure alcohol is not a carb. So therefore it's keto friendly because ketosis is all about lowering your carbohydrates. Or maybe they have heard that there's such a thing as keto friendly wine because there's no residual sugars in the wine, because a lot of times wine actually has residual sugars, um, you know, small amounts, but they still have sugar. And that also includes a category of mixed drinks with added sugar or beer that has, uh, you know, hidden sugars. But typically, if we look at pure alcohol, it's not a carb. It's not a sugar. It's something else. It doesn't even necessarily increase your blood sugars or even insulin directly. Indirectly, it creates very severe insulin resistance, but not directly. You know, um, I was traveling recently and uh, I was at the airport and I needed to get some water and all they had is a bar. So I went to the bar and I asked for some water. And he said, you sure you don't want to drink? I said, no, I'm good. Come on. You, you, know, you only live once. Go ahead. Have a drink. You know, you work hard, you play hard. So I think in a social setting, it's a, it's a bit more difficult to say no. You know, and you see these commercials where people are drinking alcohol and beer and wine and they all look so healthy. They should probably show what a heavy drinker looks like when he or she drinks alcohol. Probably not the picture of health. So what is the problem with drinking alcohol like wine uh, for your belly? Well, it all has to do with this thing called the liver. The liver cells called hepatocytes uh, treat alcohol like a poison. So they have to get rid of it. And there's a couple different things that it does. It um, initially turns it into a more reactive, more poisonous thing, which I'm not going to get into the names of it, but it actually goes through this process to try to get rid of alcohol. And the effect of this toxicity of alcohol on the hepatocyte, the liver cell, is that it injures the liver cells. It creates trauma and it can kill the liver cells. And in this process, this biochemical breakdown, you develop fat on that liver cell, the hepatocyte, which then starts turning your liver into a fatty liver. With that also comes a lot of inflammation uh, and scarring as a byproduct, okay? And if that keeps going for a period of time, you can develop cirrhosis. And then that increases your risk of getting liver cancer and all sorts of other issues. The other problem with alcohol is it greatly increases your estrogen in men, okay? And at the same time, it lowers your testosterone. And 
you probably have heard of uh, the benefits of drinking alcohol just in moderation. Um, recently, they found that was just a marketing thing uh, put out by industry. In fact, they found no benefits of drinking any amount of alcohol at all. The other problem with alcohol is that it's an empty calorie. That's right. Alcohol has calories. Now, if you look at the quantity of calories in a gram, okay, like in a carbohydrate, you have like four calories per gram. In protein, you have four calories per gram. In a fat, you have nine calories per gram. With alcohol, you have seven calories per gram. So it's almost as much as fat calories. And it's not nutrient-dense calories, it's empty calories, which means it actually has to utilize certain nutrients to metabolize it. So it'll use up certain nutrients like B1, folate, uh, other B vitamins, um, zinc, copper, things like that. So alcohol depletes these nutrients, especially B1. So the more alcohol or wine that you drink, the less B1 you're going to have. And that creates all sorts of other side issues like anxiety, worry, um, excessive thinking when you're trying to go to bed at night, nervous tension, restless leg syndrome, and just plain old fatigue, as well as hangover. Now, 50% of the population drinks alcohol, okay? So uh, chances are you're in that category. And 5% of that 50% are heavy drinkers. And so this video is just all about increasing the awareness, uh, primarily focusing on your belly, because as that liver becomes more fat, that fat then has to then go somewhere. So it spills off into around the organs as what's called ectopic fat, and then in between the organs, as visceral fat, and that's why the belly starts expanding. And if you're doing the ketogenic diet or you're doing intermittent fasting and you're drinking alcohol on the weekends, whatever, it's going to be really hard, if not impossible, to get rid of this belly fat because of what happens to the liver after you drink alcohol. You have this effect where it blocks the ability to oxidize or burn fat for a period of time a lot longer than you might think. So let's say, for example, you had a couple glasses of wine. Uh, don't expect to burn fat for probably 48 to 72 hours after that episode. So let's say, for example, you don't drink on a daily basis. You just drink every three days. That alcohol really affects the brain, cognitive-wise, mood-wise. It affects the endocrine system, the hormone system. I already mentioned lowering of testosterone, increasing estrogen. It also affects your gut. Okay, the gut microbiome, which has a whole bunch of other issues connected with that. It affects the heart. It creates a lot of negative things. What should you be doing? Well, realize the effects of alcohol, and maybe you just want to stop it altogether, especially if you want to get rid of this belly. Okay, if you can't do that because of these cravings you have, take a look at the real reason why you are drinking. Is it to reduce stress? Is it more for social uh, situations? Well, just avoid those environments where you keep getting yourself into. You know, don't gather where other people are drinking. Uh, find some friends that are non-drinkers. Don't keep alcohol in the house. Find some other ways to reduce stress. There's a lot of things like certain herbs and um, like lemon balm tea is a good one. Ashwagandha herb is another good one. B1 is one of the best things for stress reduction Try to find a natural one. And I found recently that if you take it right before bed, boy, does it help your sleep as well. And uh, you'll just go right to sleep and then you wake up and you'll feel really refreshed. And especially if you have been drinking alcohol or especially wine, um, you're going to find that it's going to fulfill a deficiency and you're just going to feel a lot better within minutes usually. The other thing you can do if you just can't give up the alcohol is to dilute the alcohol with maybe sparkling water. For example, in your wine, just fill it up with water so you have half and half. So now you're drinking half the amount, which has half of the negative effects. The other thing you can do is to take milk thistle before you go to this uh, social activity where you're, you know you're going to be drinking wine. What's so in interesting about uh, milk thistle is that milk thistle protects the liver against poisons, okay, Tylenol poisoning snake bites, poisoning from mushrooms. It's a very unique natural uh, herb 
that uh, can also help if someone has cirrhosis or inflammation in the liver or a fatty liver. So you see sugar is a big part, but it's not the only part. In this next segment, Dr. Mandel is going to give you some other tips on how to lose belly fat that you may not know. There are many ways to lose weight, but today I want to show you something more special. A way that you can burn that belly fat forever. So taking off that weight and losing inches is not difficult when you follow the golden rules. Start cutting down those carbs. This will increase your insulin sensitivity and reduce those insulin levels. Higher insulin levels go hand in hand with obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. So if you're carrying that extra weight around your belly, that is called visceral fat. And people who have higher insulin levels are gonna have more difficult removing this. So when you're eating less carbs, it means that you're likely to consume more protein. And eating more protein, such as eggs, fish, seafood, nuts, meat, dairy, legumes, all result in overall less body fat. Your body will increase this metabolic function. It will also give you a sense of satiety where you're going to feel full and you're not going to crave more food. You must start eating more fiber. This will help in the reduction of fat in the abdominal area. It will help lower your bad cholesterol levels and will prevent a buildup of plaquing within those arteries. Remember that too much sugar that cannot be stored as glycogen anymore gets converted into fat. That excess fat, as well as bad cholesterol, can start clogging the arteries. When it goes to the heart, it's called a heart attack. That same inflammation and buildup of plaque can occur to the brain, and that's called a stroke. Now your gut not only works directly with the brain, but it works with the immune system. And what goes on in the gut has a direct relationship with the health of your body. Having those probiotics in your gut, which is the good bacteria, from yogurt, kefir, fermented foods, to name a few, that alone will help increase your metabolism, allowing your system to work more efficiently so weight loss and fat burning can be accelerated. To burn belly fat, you must eat healthy fats. Those fatty fish rich in omega-3s, like salmon, herring, sardines, mackerel, or anchovies, will significantly reduce liver and abdominal fat. Avocados are one of the most healthiest fats on the planet. This will help lower your waist circumference and BMI. Be aware of those sugary drinks. If you're drinking soda, you're drinking sugar. That gets converted into fat. If you're drinking fructose, fruit juices, excessive fruit juices without fiber will put a burden on the liver. If you're sitting all day, you need to get up and move around, increasing your metabolism. Better yet, you need to make time for exercise, preferably aerobic, anything that requires your heart rate to increase. Increasing resistance training, building muscle, will increase the furnace within your body. This will burn calories at rest, helping your body burn more belly fat. And one of the most important things that we can do to help burn belly fat is increase hydration, increase our water intake. All these chemicals and hormones within our body requires water. 65 to 70% of our body is made up of water. Water will get rid of bloatiness. It will take out extra sodium that you're retaining. So when you're retaining that fluid, drinking more water will get rid of it. Be aware of the portions that you're eating. Watch your binge eating. You can eat nuts, take a handful rather than a bagful. This will make a huge difference. Let's hear from Dr. Westman again about how to lose that belly fat fast. The, the fundamental principle that's missing in the knowledge of, of people coming in and even doctors and medical students is, is that fat comes from sugar. The, the, uh, okay, you could get fat going to fat, but in our real world, the, the uh, most common thing that's happening today is extra sugar is turning to fat. So the sugar that you consume 
uh, is different than the fat that you consume because of the hormonal response that sugar makes. So, uh, you know, you hear a calorie is a calorie. Well, no, the way calories work in our body is very different depending on the hormonal response to the calorie. So if you drink uh, sugar sweetened beverage and, or, or juice, you've had extra energy for the day than, than you burnt off. Uh, it, especially if you're relying on your diet to do everything for you, you're unable to exercise or you, you don't want to exercise or you can't uh, because of pain, then you're going to be turning that sugar into fat because the sugar stimulates insulin secretion. And insulin is the fattening hormone internally, whether it comes from your pancreas or externally if you inject it as a type 2 uh, person with type 2 diabetes. Uh, so sugar turns to fat and the place uh, where the most damage can happen is if sugar is turning to fat in your belly. The abdominal fat is the fat that actually is uh, uh, associated with all of the metabolic problems of being overweight or obese. You might not know it, but obesity is up there on the risk factors for heart disease and stroke for atherosclerosis, which is the hardening or narrowing of the arteries throughout the body. So it's the belly fat or abdominal obesity. These are all the same terms uh, or visceral fat is another term that uh, is applied to the same situation of accumulating belly fat. This is associated with the serious metabolic problems that go along with overweight and obesity and many times with type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes as well. But so how do you lose that belly fat? Well, there are many different ways. You, you can use one of many different diets or medication or, or meal replacement programs or even weight loss surgery. But the one diet that really targets the belly fat is the low carb or keto diet. And the reason for that is you, you're keeping the sugars and starches so low that you maximize your fat burning from your body. So, and you don't add in oils and fats and butter and medium chain triglyceride. Don't, don't do any of those kind of internet keto things. You want the fat that your body burns to come from your belly fat. And you may not know it, but your body can actually generate ketones by itself from the fat uh, that comes from your body when you're burning your belly fat and other fat. So you don't have to drink ketones, you don't have to take ketone pills or, or have oils or, or, or even coconut oil or other, other things are being touted as ways to get into ketosis and to fat burn. But I want to maximize your belly fat burning by having you burn your belly fat, not the fat and oils that you're drinking. So to maximize the belly fat burning, you want to keep the carbs really low. And what happens on a properly formulated keto diet, one that I've been using for over 20 years now, is that the hunger goes away after a day or two. The cravings go away for the foods that you used to consume. So it happens really pretty fast. And then you start burning your body fat Typically, I'll see people lose one to two pounds per week on this kind of, you know, um, eat as much as you like of the meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish, and eggs. You keep the carbs under 20 to 30, 20 to 30. I, I prefer 20 total grams. Other programs have used 30 total grams for the day. That's not per meal, but 20 grams of carbs for the day means that you're not going to be able to burn much sugar your body looks around and says, well, there's no sugar. Where am I going to find energy? And it looks around and says, wait a sec, I have this belly fat. So you start burning your belly fat automatically just by keeping the carbs really low. Um, so you can actually become a fat burning machine, not by adding fats and oils, but by not keeping the carbs super low. So drop the sugars, starches get digested to sugar. So if you want to maximize your fat burning, your belly fat burning, you want to keep the carbs really as low as possible. And I have the 20, 30 gram total carbs for the day is a program that we've used now for over 20 years in research and clinical care. In fact, the program that, that I 
use was built upon programs that going back to the 1860s. It used to be called the Banting Diet, and then doctors in the 1900s, like Dr. Atkins, Dr. Eads, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. Rosedale, all kind of used the same super low carb diet without adding oils or ketones, without uh, all of the kind of new internet products that you'll see. It's just keeping the carbs low, eating real food uh, just as much as possible. Uh, <clears throat> so to maximize your, your fat burning and your belly fat burning, uh, keto, low carb diet is actually superior in several head-to-head -head trials with to a, a low calorie, low fat diet. And we think it's because the the insulin is brought down just a little bit lower and insulin is the fattening hormone so if you want to maximize your belly fat burning choose a keto or low carb diet over others although other diets can work medications meal replacements and, um, and even surgery can work but there's a lot of hassle with all that I think uh, using a real food based program certainly is a place to start as I look at all of the different ways we have uh, and works with doctors all around the country. There are a lot of different kinds of programs, but it seems to me the, the simplest and uh, most uh, uh, like expeditious, elegant way is to just use food to generate the, the fat burning and ketones automatically. And you do that by keeping the sugars and starches really, really low. And targeting the belly fat is really important because this is where a lot of the atherosclerosis, the, the, the uh, uh, chemicals that come out that cause inflammation come from the belly fat, also known as visceral fat, uh, abdominal obesity. It's all part of the metabolic syndrome in the bigger picture, which includes the triglyceride and HDL in the blood, the blood glucose and blood pressure, and that increased belly fat. Uh, so uh, I hope that's helpful. Remember, it's sugar that turns to fat, and, and the detail is that it happens in the liver. So yes, fatty liver is from the sugar in starch in the food, not from fat in the food. I've seen doctors trip up on that, um, so they may not give you the best advice if they're not specifically trained in this too. Now this next part is Dr. Stan Eckberg. And he's going to tell you why you won't lose belly fat until you do this. Today, we're going to talk about the five steps you must follow if you really want to lose belly fat for good. Now, most people will do maybe one or two of these steps, but hardly anyone will do all five. And that is probably why so many people fail. The first step is to understand all of the key issues involved and not fall for all of the myths and misconceptions that are floating around. So first of all, the very idea of a diet is ridiculous because the idea of a diet is that you do something for a period of time and you feel like you can really beat yourself up if it's for a limited time, but then you think after the diet you're going to go do something else, which means you're going to go back to doing all those things that created the problem in the first place. Next, we need to understand the law of thermodynamics. And this is often quoted as being about calories in and calories out. But it turns out it's not about calories in, calories out. Not the way people think and not the way they quote it. What it really comes down to is metabolism, how your body uses energy perception at the cellular level, how your cells perceive your environment and adapt to it, how your hormones are influenced by the food you eat and how those hormones affect your behavior and your hunger which influences how much you eat. There is one hormone in particular that we're talking about and that's insulin. So we have to understand what insulin does and how to reduce it. If you don't have insulin, you cannot take the glucose from the blood into the cell. So you eat food, it gets into the blood, but it does you no good whatsoever until it gets into the cell. That's what insulin does, but it needs to be in balance. 
Next, we need to understand that insulin is an anabolic hormone. Anabolic means to build up and to store, to create more tissue. Catabolic is the opposite. That means to break down or reduce. So insulin is necessary even for that reason. It's anabolic, so it helps us build tissue. It helps us store fat. But if we get too much fat storage, if we get too much insulin, then that's a problem. And if we have high levels of insulin, now because it is fat storing and because it prevents fat burning, then we also can't get to these fat stores and that's where that lack comes from. And therefore, high levels of insulin will also make you more hungry. Because if you experience lack, because you can't see the stored energy, but at the same time you're trying to use more energy, now your body is desperately going to try to make you eat more, to increase your calories in. And how hungry you get is going to depend a lot on where you are on this insulin sensitive, insulin resistant spectrum. So the person on the insulin sensitive side is relatively willing to spend energy, whereas the insulin resistant person refuses, their body refuses to use energy. So the insulin resistant person is probably going to be 10 times more hungry after spending the same amount of energy that an insulin sensitive person would be. And therefore high levels of insulin will also reduce your basal metabolic rate by the same amount that you're insulin resistant. And here is how food triggers insulin. So if you eat fat, it's going to trigger a tiny, 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 barely measurable amount of insulin. If you eat protein, it's going to increase to a moderate, slight to moderate amount. But if you eat carbohydrate, it's going to be many, many times more of a response than either protein or fat. So here's a question for you. If this is how the different foods stimulate insulin and you're trying to reduce insulin, which one would be the first food that you want to cut back on? Would it be fat, protein or carbohydrate? And the answer, of course, is carbohydrate. It is such a no-brainer. If carbohydrates stimulate this much insulin and we want to reduce insulin, that's the first thing we want to change. But this still seems to be a mystery because the standard guidelines, the mainstream guidelines still tell us to eat low fat and to eat a diet rich in carbohydrates with lots of grain. So let me show you in picture form what this would look like. If you eat food with lots of carbohydrates, then you're going to get a blood glucose spike. And then, of course, insulin is going to respond in kind, so we get an increase. It's going to be delayed a little bit because it takes a while before the body sort of recognizes it that there's a bunch of carbohydrates, but then it rises in parallel. And then by the time the carbohydrates peak and the insulin peaks, it's going to push those carbs down, but insulin is going to remain behind a little bit. It's going to lag behind a little bit. Now contrast that with eating a meal with low in carbohydrates that would look something like this. So it's the difference between throwing gasoline on a fire or throwing a log on the fire. The gasoline is going to expel all its energy all at once, whereas the log is going to take much, much longer. It's going to deliver its heat over a longer period of time, much more gentle. And then the insulin is going to rise and it's going to peak at a much lower level than before, so we don't get the blood sugar spikes, we don't get the insulin spikes. But then there's something called intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating as well. So how does that look in picture form? Well, if you eat something and you're eating high carbohydrate, then just like before, we get the spike and then we get the insulin response 
and it's going to lag behind a little bit. But what happens when you get high blood sugars and they come down quickly, now you get hungry again and you learn to eat very frequent meals. So you top off your blood sugar several times a day like this. And now here's what happens. Realize that this insulin was lagging behind. And by the time that insulin is ready to come down, we already have a new blood sugar spike. So this is not going to keep going down. It's going to increase to a higher level. And then as it starts to taper off, now we got another blood sugar spike and another and another. And this is how high carb and frequent meals are going to drive up that insulin level. And if this happened for a day or two during a party or in the summer when food was plentiful, then we're going to recover from this during a time when there is less food. But if there is always a feast, now this level never comes down. And over the years, we never give the body a chance to balance out and we drive this higher and higher. So where time-restricted eating comes in then, is if we eat this low carbohydrate, this high fat, high protein, or more protein and fat than we used to, then we're going to get a much lower spike like we said. But there's another benefit, and that is with stable energy and energy that lasts much longer, we don't have to eat so often. We still have plenty of energy circulating so we can eat again much later. And then we can also maybe skip some meals after dinner and we won't eat maybe so early in the morning. So we get a longer continuous period of fasting. So the insulin is going to come, stay stable and then it goes up and then it comes back down. And because the insulin was allowed to go back to baseline before we ate again, now we're starting from a lower level and now we have that extended fasting. And now during the night and until we eat again, insulin is allowed to fall even further. And this is how we reverse that escalating insulin level. And I'm sure you've also seen articles and I've even talked about how you can use apple cider vinegar and lemon and cinnamon and different herbal compounds and different things. And these are little tricks to add at the end. So first you reduce the carbs, then you do some time restricted eating. And these are going to account for 95% of your results. So they've done some research and they've shown that all things being equal, these will still yield some benefit, but it doesn't mean that they're as important as the top ones we talked about. And it doesn't mean that you rely on these alone. They're a super easy, smart thing to add in conjunction with changing your lifestyle. Now let's talk about exercise because exercise can absolutely help, but not for the reasons that people usually think. They typically think about burning calories. This silly notion that if I eat a cookie, then I have to exercise so many minutes to burn off the cookie. That is not how the body operates. Just forget about that. Like we talked about on the first slide there, those are the variables that we have to keep in mind. Exercise turns out to be absolutely necessary, but not for the reason people think. Exercise can be helpful, but it, the reason is that movement drives the brain. The brain controls everything about you. Every cell in your body depends on the brain's ability to link the cells together in a communication network and the brain can manage resources in the body. The brain can reduce and manage stress levels in the body. And usually when we hear about weight loss and belly fat, they will tell us that exercise is the first thing. It's the primary mechanism. It's the most important thing that we can do. And that is also false. 
So yes, we want to do it. It is necessary, but it's not going to be the primary way that we're going to burn belly fat or lose weight. And here's how that can work. Let's say that you eat some food and let's call that 100 grams of carbohydrate. Then that carbohydrate is going to turn into blood sugar. It's going to get into the bloodstream relatively quickly. And then we need insulin to assist that glucose into the tissues. And it's going to get into every tissue in the body. But we're going to focus on primarily two just for our discussion here. So on the one hand, a lot of glucose is going to get into the muscle tissue. And after a meal, the muscles will actually absorb most of the glucose. They have a large reservoir. And the other tissue is the liver. So the liver stores carbohydrate in the form of glycogen and muscles can also store carbohydrate. And here's the really, really important thing to understand. That if you are at rest, then the glucose going from the bloodstream into these tissues are always going to need insulin. However, if you are exercising, if that muscle is working and contracting, now that glucose can get into the muscle without insulin or with very, very little insulin. So basically, a working muscle is going to suck the glucose out of the bloodstream without needing insulin. So let's say hypothetically that we're going to put 50 grams uh, into the liver and 50 grams into the muscle. That's 100 grams that needs insulin if we're at rest, but if we're exercising, now 50 needs insulin and 50 is going to get sucked out of the bloodstream anyway. So in that sense, and this is just a hypothetical example, we would only need half as much insulin to handle that carbohydrate load. And that is how exercise can help improve insulin sensitivity by reducing the total carbohydrate load on the other tissues. However, it's not going to be the primary mechanism because the liver is still sort of the central mechanism that if we have insulin resistance and we have a fatty liver, then we have to change our diet and we need to do some intermittent fasting to allow that liver to burn up some of that fat and become insulin sensitive again. The muscles working will suck the glucose out of the bloodstream, but they will not pull the fat straight out of the liver. It doesn't work that way. The next question, of course, is what type of exercise would we want to do? And if you go on YouTube or you go online and you see exercise to reduce belly fat, 90% of that is going to talk about crunches. And why does that not work? Because crunches, again, is not going to change how the liver operates. It's not going to suck the, the fat out of the liver. And crunches are only going to affect a very small muscle group. And that's not going to pull a whole lot of glucose out either. It's going to pull a tiny little bit. But when people say that crunches are going to help you with belly fat, Basically, what they're implying is that you can pull the fat straight out of the fat cells on top of the muscle. But it doesn't work that way because there are many, many layers. There is no communication pathway. There is no pipeline between this muscle and that fat just because they happen to be next to each other. So crunches can be good for core strength if you do them properly, but they're not going to be the way to burn belly fat. So what do you do? Resistance training is great. And when you put a load on your muscles, you stimulate the muscles to grow, especially if it's heavy, especially if you're near your limit for what you can perform. So this does two things. When you 
challenge a muscle, it will tend to grow. And if you maintain or increase your muscle mass, muscles are more metabolically active. So by maintaining or increasing your muscle mass, you will actually increase your basal metabolic rate. Resistance training or heavy weightlifting also will increase your growth hormone, which is a fat burning hormone. Most of the exercise you want to do is aerobic, meaning things like walking and biking. It's things that you can do for a very long period of time without getting exhausted. So you want to keep it below the level of huffing and puffing because then if you can provide oxygen for the exercise, that means you're burning mostly fat. As you start huffing and puffing, that means that you're changing, you're switching from the fat burning to the carbohydrate burning because as long as you have oxygen, you can burn fat. When that oxygen is not enough, now you have to start breaking down glucose. So if you're huffing and puffing, you are automatically switching somewhat. And the more intense that exercise is, the more you're going to switch to glucose. So does that mean that you can never do any anaerobic or any high intensity? No, it does not mean that at all. But the high intensity needs to be much shorter duration than the aerobic. And there's two reasons you want to keep the high intensity short duration. One is that you're switching to carbohydrate burning instead of burning the fat that you want to burn. And the second is that the higher the intensity, the more cortisol you're going to release and stimulate. And cortisol is a stress hormone, which leads us in to step number four. And most people don't really understand what stress is, even though it's a word that we use every day. There's a whole lot more to it than just feeling overwhelmed, than the emotion of stress. So if we create a little scenario here where we have a person who is in an environment and he's at rest and then something shows up where this person feels threatened. Now this person's nervous system is going to react and even if he was at peace and burning mostly fat, this body, the physiology of the body is going to anticipate that he has to work, that he has to run and fight and flee and expend more energy. So now this body is going to release cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And the primary thing that that cortisol does is to increase blood glucose because Blood sugar is a faster fuel than just fat. It's an additional fuel. So if we can ramp up the glucose, raise blood glucose a little bit, now we have more of an emergency fuel with which to escape that danger. But if this happens all the time where this becomes a default baseline, now we're also going to increase cravings on a regular basis because if the body is trying to get more glucose then it's going to tell you to go eat some sugar and with more cortisol and more cravings of course now you're also going to bring up insulin and again chronicity will lead to insulin resistance and when we talk about weight loss and belly fat the rules are basically there's like a 98 percent overlap you do the same thing for both of them except this part because even though stress is bad for weight loss as well, it is even worse for belly fat because cortisol will selectively put fat onto the torso. Everywhere from the hip to the head, that's where the fat accumulation is going to happen much more when we have high cortisol. And hardly anyone ever talks about this. They talk about diet, they talk about exercise, but nobody realizes how incredibly important this is. So am I exaggerating the impact on, of stress? Well, let's take a look at a piece of research from PubMed where they talked about all these different things on how the stress affects hormones and cortisol and body type and behavior. So first 
they start off saying that there is a strong relationship between the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis. And don't worry, that's a lot of big words for stress response. It's how the brain reacts and it sends the signal down to the adrenals that can produce cortisol and adrenaline. And then they say there's a strong relationship between this stress response and the way the body uses energy. The energy homeostasis, which is basically another word for metabolism and how stress changes the priorities. And then they go on to verify what I just said, that patients with abdominal obesity will also have high cortisol levels. Then it gets really good because they go on to say that stress and glucocorticoids, meaning hormones that affect blood sugar like cortisol, which we just talked about, they act to control our behavior both in terms of food intake and energy expenditure. And it gets even better. They say in particular, this is known to increase consumption of foods that have been enriched with sugar and fat. Do you know what those foods are called? They're called comfort foods and junk foods and processed foods. So what they're saying plainly is that stress increases your cravings for junk. And I love this last one because they're saying that it is well known in all species that the way this stress response affects us is highly variable. So again, we can't compare one person to another and how they respond to stress. It is individual and variable. And usually when they talk about stress, they talk about managing it by avoiding it or distracting yourself. But you want to recondition your nervous system. The stress is not in the world. The events are in the world. The stress is your response to them. And you can change those. You can recondition your nervous system. So when you do breathing exercises, for example, you're helping your body balance the stress response. When you breathe in, you fire off the fight flight. When you breathe out, you fire off the feed breathe, the parasympathetic, the calming response. And if you do this on a regular basis, it goes beyond the five or 10 minutes that you do the breathing. It's a skill that you entrain in your nervous system. And the next thing that you can do is mindfulness. This is one of the most important things. We've heard the word, but what does it mean? You have to make it really important to pay attention to how you feel. As you're driving through traffic, you got nothing better to do but to ask yourself, how am I feeling? Am I feeling the way I want to? Can I focus differently? Can I change something? And if you pay attention, there's always something that you can do. Meditation is another huge thing that you can do. And meditation is simply stilling and calming your mind. It's tricking your mind into stop doing the things that it always does. All right. And there's guided meditations that will help you along there. And exercise is another way to deal with stress because, like I said, exercise fires up the brain. When the brain is working better, it can control stress better. And another aspect of stress is sleep. We need to get good quality and quantity sleep. And if you don't get good sleep, then the very next morning, your cortisol levels, your stress hormone levels, are going to be higher. You're going to be more insulin resistant after a single night of poor or insufficient sleep. And a lot of people have trouble sleeping, but realize that all the things on this list, the breathing exercises and the exercise and the meditation, they all help to calm you down and put your nervous system in balance to where you can sleep better. And step number five is to develop a holistic lifestyle. And holistic is not some mysterious word. It's not about holy. It's not about crystals or burning incense or becoming a mystic. Holistic simply means that we look at the whole body. We look at the whole picture. We look at all the different aspects that influence the body. And we need to understand something called the triad of health. It's like three legs on a three-legged table that 
the human body has a chemical aspect to it. It has a structural or mechanical aspect to it. And it has an emotional or a stress aspect to it, just like we saw in that paper. And what this means is that on the chemical side, there are things that we can do better, things we can improve on and things that we can avoid. So on the chemical side, we have nutrients that build us up and we need to learn what those are and improve those and get a steady supply on a regular basis. And then there are things that are toxic, things that interfere with our biochemistry. And those are things that we need to learn to avoid. Same thing with structure. There is movement, which is positive. There is good posture, which helps the body maintain proper signals for the nervous system that maintains proper movement. And then there is sedentary lifestyle and poor posture that interferes with mechanical signals. And then, of course, there is the emotional side. So there are things that make us feel good and there are things that make us feel bad. And all of these are equally important. And sometimes people, they talk, oh, we just need to exercise or we just need to eat less carbs or more vegetables or whatever it is that's in fashion this week. But we need to understand that the body needs a holistic lifestyle. There's three legs to the table. If you do them all, then your chances of getting healthy, not just losing belly fat, but developing optimal health is going to be so much better. And the more that you can incorporate all aspects, the more you're going to notice that you feel better, not just in the things that you had problems with before, but you notice your focus, your mood, your happiness, everything starts getting better because everything feeds into each other. And then realize that once you start being really happy and you start feeling really good, well, that's just the price you have to pay for being healthy. So are you ready to do the things to lose that belly fat? Do you want to do it extremely fast? Listen to Dr. Berg again about how to do just that. Now, what is the goal of getting on the ketogenic plan? The goal is to bring your insulin levels as low as possible. That is the goal. If your insulin levels are low, you have a maximum fat burning, you have maximum ketosis. Ketosis is a state of producing ketones. Ketones are the byproduct of fat burning. And so the more ketones you generate, the more fat you're going to burn and the faster you're going to lose your midsection. Now at the very top level of keto, uh, we have these macros. We have carbohydrates and you want to keep your carbs between people say between 30 and 50 grams, but I'm going to tell you, keep them below 20 grams or less, especially if you want to speed things up. And then we have protein. We want to keep that between three to six ounces of protein per meal, but that varies depending on your size and your metabolism and your age and how many meals you're consuming. If you're just doing OMAD one meal a day, obviously you're going to be doing more protein. If you're a bodybuilder, if you're exercising a lot, you're going to need a little bit more, but for the average person, um, just consume the amount of protein per meal, the size of the palm of your hand. Okay. That's it. I just want to keep it really, really simple. Now, as far as fat goes, you're going to be consuming 75% of your calories of fat. Now, what does that mean? 75% of your calories. How much is that in grams or ounces? So for this video, I'm not going to get into the complexities of measuring different grams to get your macros. So when I explain the tips, you'll understand how much fat you'll need. All right. Tip number one, instead of counting your grams of carbs, um, it's going to be much easier to consume certain carbs that you don't have to count. Okay. And I'm talking about leafy green vegetables, salads, because this is mostly fiber and the insulin response is almost zero because fiber is the only carbohydrate that does not affect insulin. So when we're talking about salad, we don't have to be counting carbohydrates. In fact, I want you to consume a larger amount of salad. I want you to consume at least seven cups of salad per day. It's not hard to do that. And one little tip on this point with salad to make it easier to consume is we use a salad cutter. So we actually cut the salad down. So we have this bowl of salad and then we cut it down 
and it just makes it even smaller and it's easier to consume. So instead of trying to be overwhelmed with all these carbs, just use vegetable carbohydrates, okay? Like salad and don't even worry about counting your carbs. And you could put other things on it as well, like feta cheese, definitely put the olive oil or vinaigrette and just make sure your salad dressing has like, I don't know, one or less carbs, okay? There are so many salad dressings that are out now that are virtually carb-free, but there's so many other salad dressings that are just loaded with sugar and that could be a hidden problem. Now, why do we want to consume all this salad? Well, keto is all about being low carb, right? Keto doesn't emphasize adding more nutrients. The type of keto that I always recommend is the healthy version of ketosis. So we're not only reducing insulin, we're enhancing nutrients so you can actually be healthier at the end of the day. There's huge benefits of lowering your carb, but there's also huge benefits of having nutrient-dense foods. And the thing that salad has is it has a lot of potassium, it has a lot of magnesium, and it has a lot of vitamin C. In addition to other vitamins like vitamin K1 and folic acid, and it has a lot of phytonutrients, which are those things that go way beyond just the normal vitamins and minerals and trace minerals. But consuming this large amount of salad on a keto plan will give you these nutrients to prevent keto cramps in your calves. It can help prevent keto fatigue, keto flu, and it'll improve a condition called insulin resistance. So it'll help lower insulin even more, and it'll even give you energy. Now, as a side note, additional tip, I always recommend to do your salad first. If you do your salad first, you'll definitely not overeat your protein. If you eat your protein first and then your salad, I find a lot of people can't seem to consume that much salad after they eat the protein. Now, if you're having a hard time with doing that much salad, do what you can, and you can also enhance things with a good electrolyte powder. Now, I'm not biased of my own electrolyte powder, but I will say that it is the highest quality electrolyte on the market. So the tip number one is consume the salad at the beginning part of your meal. All right, number two, protein. There's a couple practical things about protein you need to know. Um, first of all, maybe you want to start with the protein the size of the palm of your hand. Um, and if you're a bigger person or a younger person, have more. And if you're a older person with a slower metabolism, have a little bit less. If you have too much protein, then you're going to find that you're going to feel sluggish and that can slow down your ketosis as well. Now, the same goes with not enough protein. You can feel too tired because your body needs a certain amount of protein. Now, the key with protein is don't do low fat protein. Find a protein that has the most fat. Fat normally comes with protein. And so if you're going to do a hamburger, which I actually eat a lot of hamburger, get the fattiest hamburger. If you're going to do fish, don't get the leanest fish. Do the salmon or even sardines. Both of them are high in fat, and that's going to be much better than the lean protein. If you're going to do chicken, don't just do the skinless chicken breasts. Do the parts of the chicken that have the skin and the fat. Now, why is that? Because when you consume lean protein, you stimulate insulin a little bit more than if it was fattier protein. In fact, the thing that stimulates insulin a very high level is whey protein because there's hardly any fat in whey. And that's the type of protein that I would not recommend. But the point is try to get protein that comes with more fat. Pork has a lot more fat than other types of meat. If you do steak, try to eat the fat that normally comes with the steak. All right, that's tip number two. Now, tip number three is about fat. Now, if you're new to keto and you're just starting out, it's very important to increase the amount of fat at each meal. So that could be consuming more nuts. I like pecans, but you can do other types of nuts as well. You can do macadamia nuts. You have olives, avocado. You have more olive oil on your salad. You have MCT oil. But the question is, if you're eating all this fat, is that going to slow down weight loss? And the answer is yes, because the initial goal of the ketogenic plan is not necessarily to jump right into weight loss. It is to do this. And this is very, very important. It is very, very important to also do intermittent fasting with healthy keto. Now, why? 
Well, if you were to check your ketones, your blood ketones, and the scale goes up from zero all the way up to like seven, it can go a little bit higher, but roughly there's a scale, right? If you do just keto without intermittent fasting, chances are you're not going to get above one, two, maybe three, okay? Your level of ketones. The higher, the more ketosis, the deeper fat burning you're going to be in, and the lower in the scale, the less you're going to be into ketosis. So if you wanted to get your numbers like four, five, maybe six, you need to add intermittent fasting and potentially even exercise, but we're not going to talk about exercise right now. We just want to talk about intermittent fasting. So the combination of low carb and intermittent fasting together is really powerful if you want fast results getting rid of your belly fat. And to do that very easily, we don't want you to have an appetite. We don't want you to be hungry all the time. We don't want you to have cravings. So the first strategy or tip to do this is to add more fat to the meal so you can go longer without eating. So you can start your intermittent fasting pattern. So the first goal is not to eat breakfast, okay? To go as long as possible. And then have your first meal about 12 and your second meal at six. And then over time, you'll squish these two meals closer and closer and closer. And for some people, you're just gonna like eliminate the lunch altogether and just do the dinner. So you're doing one meal a day, which is called OMAD. Now, when you eat this fat at the meal, you're gonna be very satisfied, okay? And within two to three days, you're not going to be hungry at all. You're going to lose your appetite. Why? Because you're able to fast longer and you're going to be more into ketosis. So in other words, your body is going to start burning your own fat, which is a new concept for a lot of people. But here is the next point. Don't eat if you're not hungry. So many people screw this up because they're doing this robotic. They're told this is how many meals that you need to have per day and they're doing low carb, but they're not losing weight, and they're eating when they're not even hungry. Huge mistake. If you're not hungry, don't eat. Why would you want to screw up your fat burning? I mean, here you are, you finally lowered your carbs, your body is tapping into your fat, it's getting rid of the fat on your liver and your midsection, and your appetite is gone because you are eating when you're not eating, and then you eat a meal. And now you're going to be hungry a little bit later. Because every time you eat, you pop yourself out of ketosis, regardless of what you eat, just because eating triggers insulin. And high insulin blocks the state of ketosis. This is why we do intermittent fasting. And this is why this rule is so important. So as soon as you start getting into this adaptation where you're burning your own fat and your hunger goes away, the next meal, you start cutting down your fat this MCT oil, the extra nuts. Why would we want to do this? Because, and this especially applies if you have a slow metabolism. If the body has a choice between dietary fat and its own fat, it's going to go after and burn the dietary fat before your own fat. And what we're trying to do is to get you to burn off your own belly fat. And so you don't want to go crazy with too much fat while you're in the middle of this plan. In the very beginning part of ketosis, you want to increase fat. And at the very end of this cycle, when you reach your goal, that's when we also want to increase your fat, but not in the middle of this program where you're just in fat burning and you lost your appetite, you're not craving, everything's going great. You don't have to add a lot of fat. You just want to have the fat that normally comes with the protein. Now, you definitely don't want to go low fat but just don't start adding all this additional fat unless you have a high metabolism. When you're doing intermittent fasting, when you're doing ketosis, it's very important to include all the nutrients that you need to prevent nutritional deficiencies because you're no longer going to be doing three meals and snacks. And so if you're going to do two meals or one meal, it's a little more difficult to get your nutrients. And the fact that you're in ketosis means that you're going to be burning up different nutrients. The requirements of certain nutrients are going to be higher than they were before. So you're going to need more B vitamins, more electrolytes. One of the good sources of the B vitamins is nutritional yeast. And I'm not telling you, you need to consume my nutritional yeast. You can do any type of nutritional yeast. Just make sure it's not fortified with synthetic vitamins. But the B vitamins are very, very important. 
uh, electrolytes are very important, and sea salt is very, very important. If you're not consuming extra sea salt, what's going to happen is you're going to feel weak. Make mental note of that and start adding more sea salt to your diet. Now, if you're consuming a large salad at that meal, um, the need for electrolytes will not be as great because you're going to be getting potassium and magnesium and other minerals as well. All right, number five, we want to make this a lifestyle change. We want this to be enjoyable. The fact that your cognitive function is going to improve, your energy is going to improve, your mood is going to improve, and your belly is going to shrink is all going to make you happier. You're going to feel better. But a lot of people miss all these kind of uh, pleasure foods. And so there's a couple things that um, I include after a meal that you might want to also include. And one is a low carb chocolate. You can do Lily's chocolate. There's a lot of other chocolate products that you can consume that have low carb. And, but I tend to do a little chocolate after my first meal, not a whole bar. I might have a half a bar and it's actually quite pleasurable. The other thing you can do, not every meal, but maybe a few times a week is to make some really cool uh, keto desserts and have one of those at the end of the meal. It's very, very pleasurable, very enjoyable. And that way you can look forward to having some healthy version of a dessert. So at this point, if you do these basic things, these five things, you're going to notice some considerable results, but you're going to still have questions. And I have a lot of videos on the questions that you have, but I don't want you to get overwhelmed with all these details and lost in the woods. I want you to keep it really, really simple and just jump in without having to learn an entire book of details. In fact, I just recommend that you start right now while it's fresh in your mind. And so if questions come up, just do a search. I have a video for every single question you have. But there's two more things I want to mention. If something is working, don't change anything. So many people go along and they're getting great results and then they change something. Why did you change something? It was working. Just keep going. But on the flip side, if something is not working, then you need to change something. And for that information, I have a lot of videos on Plateau, and I'll put some links down below. You can save those and then watch them when you need them. And the last point, and probably the most important point, is this concept of you don't lose weight to get healthy. You have to get healthy to lose weight. And we can't leave this out. Dr. Barry has 10 tips to help you lose that belly fat extremely fast, and we've got to hear that. Make sure you stick around for that one supplement that you need to supercharge the loss of belly fat. A few years back, I was actually morbidly obese myself and suffered from Dunlap. That's something we talk about in the Southern United States. It's when your belly Dunlapped over your belt. Number one, when you go grocery shopping, stick to the outer aisles, the outer wall of the grocery store. That's where you're gonna find all the natural foods. That's where you're gonna find meat, eggs, cheese, full fat dairy, some vegetables, some berries. These are real foods that your body actually know how to use. Number two is choose only one ingredient foods. Okay, so if something has more, more than two ingredients, whatever the ingredient is and maybe salt, don't buy it. Only buy one ingredient foods. Your body knows what to do with ribeye. It has one ingredient. Your body knows what to do with broccoli. It has one ingredient. But if you start shopping in the center of the store, you're gonna find things that have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 ingredients, many of which are going to spike your insulin and cause you to not lose that sticky belly fat that you just can't get rid of. Number three, don't ever drink a carbohydrate or a sweetener, okay? So this applies obviously to the soft drinks. This also applies to the fruit juices. If what you're about to drink contains even one gram of carbohydrate, don't drink it because your body doesn't know the difference between added sugar or natural sugar. And so whether you're gonna drink a Pepsi or whether you're gonna drink some organic grape juice, it makes no difference. It contains sugar. It is going to make you build belly fat instead of getting rid of it. Number four, eat at least one gram of protein per kilogram of your body weight every day. 
protein is satiating. Also, your, your body needs all of the amino acids contained in that protein to renew and rejuvenate itself. So the protein is not optional. Uh, eating this much protein a day may be new to you, but I promise you it's going to keep you fuller for longer, and that's going to keep you from eating the junk and make the belly fat keep disappearing. Number five is eat more fat. And I know you just went, wait, what? Yeah, eat more fat. Fat is the most satiating of all three macronutrients being fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Carbohydrates don't really satiate you or fill you up at all. That's why you have to eat every two hours if you eat lots of carbohydrates. Also, eating carbohydrates turns immediately into sugar or glucose in your blood, and that spikes your insulin. Anytime your insulin's high, you ain't going to burn that belly fat. Does that make sense? So you want to eat plenty of protein and you want to eat plenty of fat every single day. My favorite is the fat found in fatty cuts of animal meats. You can also eat plant fats. That's fine. But eat lots of fat every day. Number six is eat plenty of real salt. I know, again, you're like, wait, this doctor just told me to eat salt. Yes, yes, I did. Here's why. Many times when you get a craving, that craving is actually for salt or for a mineral. It's not actually for the Cheetos or Doritos. So if you eat plenty of salt each day, and it's a real salt, so it has minerals in it as well as sodium and chloride, then you're going to be giving your body all the minerals it needs and you're not going to be having weird cravings that make you wind up going to the center of the store where all of the processed carbohydrates are hiding in plain sight. Number seven, recognize your sugar addiction. Any carbohydrate breaks down to sugar. Sugar hits our pleasure centers in our brain just like some illicit drugs. It's absolutely, without a doubt, true that some people are very, very addicted to sugar. And so if you have a craving and fall off the wagon, then don't necessarily beat yourself up about being a glutton. Just look in the mirror and say, hi, I'm filling your name and I am a sugar addict. And once you come to grips with that, that you're a sugar addict, it makes what you're fighting against much easier because if you know your enemy, then you have a better chance of defeating your enemy. But if you think that your enemy is just eating too much in general or laying on the couch too much, that's, that's kind of hard to fight. But if you know it's the sugar, it's the carbohydrates, I'm a sugar addict, I have to fight that specific battle every day, that's going to make it a lot easier. Number eight is limit your alcohol intake to one serving a day, and this needs to be a carbohydrate-free, sweetener-free drink. And so if you make a mixed drink, make sure that you use something that has zero carbs and no artificial sweeteners, because any sweet taste in your mouth is gonna raise your insulin level. And when your insulin's high, you ain't burning no belly fat. So you can have your one drink a day, and I don't mean one drink a day, I mean a serving size of alcohol a day, if you even want it. The alcohol is not gonna help you lose weight, but it's also not gonna make you gain weight if you just have one serving. It's just kind of uh, a wash. So you make your decision. Number nine, stop all sugars, whether added or natural. Okay, so if you drink a two liter of Coke, that's a ton of sugar. If you eat a full bag of those beautiful, delicious Niagara seedless grapes, that's also a ton of sugar. Your body can't tell the difference. It doesn't know whether the, the sugar came from Pepsi or orange juice or the big bag of grapes. Stop eating any sugar and your belly fat will start to melt away effortlessly. Number 10 implement some degree of intermittent fasting into your lifestyle every single day. Try to go for at least a 16 hour fast. So if you sleep for eight hours a day, then that means you would you would wait four hours after you wake up to eat your first meal and you would stop eating four hours before you go to bed. You don't have to do this every single day, but I want you to move towards doing a 16 or 18 hour fast every single day because when you're fasting, your insulin level is very low normal and that's the sweet spot for losing belly fat effortlessly. Number 11, your bonus is avoid protein bars and protein shakes. Now, wait a minute. I thought in number four, I told you to eat lots of protein. Yes, I did. 
The problem with protein bars and protein shakes is that they're very often mislabeled. If you look at the total carbohydrates and the protein and the fat, most often, almost always, they're highest in carbohydrates. So they should really be called carbohydrate shakes and carbohydrate bars. That's not gonna help keep your insulin low normal. If you wanna eat a protein bar, then cut your ribeye in strips and hold it like this and call it a bar. That's a protein bar. If it comes in a plastic wrap in a cardboard box, that's a carbohydrate bar and that's never ever going to help you burn fat off your midsection effortlessly. Now there are two diets that will absolutely help you lose belly fat effortlessly. And they're gonna pop up here and here as a playlist at the end of this video. Pick the one that looks the most appetizing to you and watch the videos and learn. I promise you there's no products to buy. There's no service to sign up for. There's no coach to pay. You don't need to buy any supplements. None of that stuff is necessary. You just have to pick one of these two diets and stick to it. Now, if you we just gotta let Dr. Barry continue. Are you ready for the one supplement you need? Let them tell you all about it. Apple cider vinegar has been shown in controlled research in humans to lower postprandial insulin and glucose. And that means your insulin and glucose levels after you eat a meal. And so this is, this is a big deal because high blood sugar is obviously bad for you, but high insulin levels will actually make you store fat instead of burning fat. So that's a big deal. Number two, there's actually research in humans that shows that ACV, that's what we're gonna call apple cider vinegar to save time, actually causes more satiation or a feeling of fullness. So if you use apple cider vinegar, like I'm gonna tell you at the end of this video, you'll actually just not be as hungry. And so if you're trying to fast, you can fast for longer by implementing ACV into your fasting regimen. Or if you're just trying to go longer in between meals or trying not to snack, ACV can actually help you with that and there's research to back that up. Number three, ACV can actually help lower your blood pressure. It, it looks like in the research, and this was a rat study, that's the only one I could find, but still it looks like that it actually decreases renin activity, which is intimately related with high blood pressure. And so people with high blood pressure, first of all, need to focus on their diet and getting that fixed. But secondly, ACV may help you along in your journey to lower your blood pressure. Uh, number four is fat loss. ACV has actually been shown in human research to increase the speed that you burn stored fat. And so fat loss is a big deal for most of us. And uh, first and foremost, again, is diet that I talk about on this channel all the time. But ACV may actually help you along your fat loss journey to help you burn more fat. Next is ACV actually improves fatty liver. Now, fatty liver is absolutely reversible with a low carb or a keto or a carnivore diet, but ACV, when you're first getting started, may help you burn the fat out of your liver even quicker than just with diet alone. Uh, that's the five research-backed reasons that you might use apple cider vinegar. And I put a link to all the research down in the show notes. If you're on a, a laptop, then it's right there. If you're on a cell phone, you have to scroll through a bunch of video recommendations and then you'll see the show notes. I put the research there because I don't want you to ever blindly believe me. And I don't want you to blindly believe anybody, including the big health organizations, because people are people and sometimes we get it wrong. The last benefit I wanna tell you about before I get into how to actually use apple cider vinegar is heartburn relief or GERD or reflux. Uh, back when I was eating the standard American diet and even the paleo diet, I suffered from severe heartburn every single day. And I found that using apple cider vinegar like I talk about below, really decreased my symptoms of heartburn and reflux. And so there's there's yet to be a decent research study on this. There is a um, uh, master studies uh, doctoral thesis that I listed down below that does talk about this a little, but there needs to be better research done on all of these aspects of ACV, especially the heartburn relieving capability of ACV, because I have gotten reports from thousands of patients and people on social media saying, if I use ACV like you tell me to, my heartburn symptoms are drastically better. So heartburn, yeah, it worked for me. I used to keep a bottle of apple cider vinegar right there on my shelf. 
in my cubby at my medical practice. And every time I had heartburn, I would take a little shot and it helped tremendously. Now, uh, let's talk about how to use apple cider vinegar. So first and foremost, you need to buy a reputable brand that contains the mother. And I put a link down in the show notes below to the apple cider vinegar that me and my family use and love all the time. Uh, you want to always shake up your apple cider vinegar before you use it so that you shake the mother up. That, the mother is the little cloudy stuff at the bottom. You don't want to leave that at the bottom. You want to shake that up and use that too. Uh, you want to use at least 15 milliliters a day of apple cider vinegar. And there's multiple different ways you can do that. You can just take a little five ml shot right before each meal. So you're getting your 15 mls a day. If you want to use more, you can. There's no danger from apple cider vinegar that I've ever seen in any meaningful research. Some people just abhor the taste of apple cider vinegar, and so they'll mix it with four ounces of water. And then in, in two or three large gulps, you can get it down, and it doesn't taste nearly as strong as if you just take a shot of it. You can also use apple cider vinegar to make an excellent oil and vinegar dressing. I would use avocado oil, olive oil, or coconut oil to make this dressing. You can put some herbs and spices in there. And don't think you have to just put the oil and vinegar dressing on salad. You can put it on any vegetable, whether it's raw or cooked. You can actually put it on your meat. I love dipping uh, sirloin steak bites into an oil and vinegar dressing. It's very delicious, and you're probably getting some of the ACV benefits as well. One way that a lot of people who are doing low carb or keto like to use ACV is to make Keterade. And this is actually a drink that you can sip on during a fast and it doesn't break your fast or you can you can drink it during the day if you like the taste of it. Uh, my wife and I did a video about this and I'm going to pop a link up to that recipe if you want to check it out. It's super easy to make. It cost about 10 cents a gallon to make it. And it, it, you could benefit from all of the benefits that I talk about in this video. So from this group of doctors, we figured out that the keto diet is the best way to lose the belly fat. For more about the keto diet from some different doctors, check this video out right here. I think it'll be helpful for you on how to do keto. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this and I'll see you on the next video.